Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Tonight what I want to do is solve a angular momentum problem and more specifically a problem where this angular momentum of a system is conserved. So this is the problem I want to consider. So it's kind of like a classical merry-go-round problem. We have this uh, merry-go-round which I'm going to model as just a solid disk. It rotates freely at an angular speed of 20 rotations per minute. All right, we have a student at the edge of that disc. It has a radius of two meters standing at the edge, and he starts to walk slowly toward the middle. Okay. Now, what happens to the angular frequency of the disc when he's closer to the middle? He starts off at the edge. He's going to finish when he's a distance of 0 0.5 meters from the center. How can we calculate the final angular velocity of this spinning disc and the guy combined? All right, and the second part, I want to look at what happens to the kinetic energy of the system here, uh, which includes the man on the spinning disc. All right, so like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel. It's the best way to support what I do. All right, let's get started. All right, the key to solving this problem is to realize that when he's walking toward the center, his foot is making contact with that platform and it's not slipping, all right? That's the key. So it's really like a static friction situation. But as he makes contact, there is a force acting on his shoe. There's also a force acting on the platform, right? By Newton's third law. Now the key to this problem is you gotta lump both of these things together. So him and the platform form a system together. And since it rotates freely, we're neglecting any friction acting on this uh, merry-go-round. Um, there's no other, there's no external forces acting on the system and there are no external torques acting on this system right here as he's walking toward. Now, if there is no external torque acting on the system, it means that the angular momentum of the guy and the disc combined have to be a conserved quantity. All right, if you understand this point, the rest of the problem should be pretty straightforward. All right, so I consider a system here composed of the disc, spinning disc, and the man on top of it, or the student rather. All right, so if you consider now Newton's second law for rotation, acting on the system here. It says that you add up all the torque acting on this combined object, which in this case is zero, right? Newton's second law says the torque is equal to the change of angular momentum with respect to time. And we're looking at the angular momentum of the system. But guess what? There is no change in angular momentum of the system. So that means that all you have to do then is write what is the initial angular momentum of the system, the combination of the disc and the student, and that must equal to the final angular momentum of the system. So that's all we have to do. Now, how do you write the angular momentum of uh, the system initially? Well, that is when the student is in this initial position right here. Well, the way you write angular momentum is you're going to consider the angular momentum of each object. So it's going to be the angular momentum of the disc and then plus the angular momentum of the student in the initial configuration. All right, so on this uh, left-hand side here, this is going to be the initial values. All right, and then that has to be equal to the final angular momentum. Well, again, we have a disc and a student. Let me just put a little subscript I here just to distinguish that. After we're going to have a spinning disc, I'll just write it disc final, and plus the angular momentum of the student. And again, in the final configuration. Now for the disc, the angular momentum of a disc is pretty straightforward. Okay, the angular momentum of a disc, you can write as the moment of inertia of that disc, multiplied by the initial angular frequency. For the student, well, the student is standing at the edge. All right, what you do is you treat the student as a point mass, and the angular momentum at the edge is very, very straightforward. So I'm just gonna write it for now as a student. And guess what? At the initial configuration, he's also spinning at the same angular frequency. All right, now this must be equal to the final angular momentum. So again, we simply write the disc, final, plus, oh, multiplied by a different angular frequency now. I'm gonna call it omega f plus the angular momentum of the student. Again, it's the moment of inertia of the student. 
multiplied by the same final angular velocity. And this is really what I'm trying to solve in this problem is this final angular velocity. All right, let's go on the next page and write down, substitute the values for the moment of inertia and do some algebra in order to solve for what the final angular velocity is. All right, we'll start substituting some values here for the disc spinning about the uh, center right here. The moment of inertia is one half, the mass of the disc and the radius of the disc squared. All right, I'm gonna factor out the initial angular speed here. So to that, I wanna add the moment of inertia of a student. The student is in this initial configuration and he has a mass little m. So I'm gonna write it as m multiplied by r squared. Again, because his initial position is the radius of the disc. All right, all of this now, I factored out the initial angular speed. Now, what in the final configuration do I have? Again, I'm gonna factor out the final omega here. And before all I have is the disc. The disc hasn't changed as he's walking toward the center. So its moment of inertia is still one half mr squared. No need to change that value. Now, what has changed is this final moment of inertia of the student here. Should have a little subscript f because he's closer to the center over here. So what you end up doing here is you write little m for his mass. Now I'm gonna write it as rf squared and rf is 0 0.5 meters. Now all of this is the total moment of inertia of the final configuration multiplied by that final angular speed. All right, so all you do now is I do a little bit of algebra, simply take all of this and divide it by this whole term over here. Just be careful when you write it out and then we have to substitute the numbers in. So here we go. So that's the initial moment of inertia multiplied by the initial angular frequency divided by one half m r squared plus m r f squared. Now you see what happens over here is this term over here is actually going to be smaller than the term in the numerator because the student walks closer to the center, the moment of inertia of that student is smaller. So that means when I divide by a smaller number, it means that my final angular velocity is going to be bigger than the initial angular velocity. Now what you could do is you could convert this to uh, get radians per second, and then you can get a final omega in radians per second. All right, so let's go ahead and finish the problem now on the next page. All right, let's first convert this here to some value in radians per uh, second. Because we started off here with 20 rotations per minute. And what I wanna do is I wanna convert that into radians uh, per second. So in order to make that conversion, first I wanna change rotations and I wanna get radians at the end. And I know in one rotation there is two pi radians. I also want to eliminate minutes and I want to get seconds. I know in one minute there's 60 seconds. So if you multiply all of this out, uh, you should get an initial angular uh, frequency here of 2.0, say 94 radians per second. All right, now we can calculate our final angular velocity here. So we go back to our equation over here. A lot of terms here, so be careful. One half, the mass was 100. The radius was two squared, plus the mass of the student was 60. He's initially two meters away. Don't forget to square that. Divided by, this is the same term, two squared. And now here, be a little bit careful. His mass is 60. Now this changes to 0 0.5. And then after I have to multiply by the initial angular frequency. Okay, uh, at the end, if you substitute this uh, in the calculator, uh, you should get a value that's approximately 4 point, say 4.285. Uh, radians per second. Now you can convert that back to uh, RPMs. Uh, if you do that, that's equivalent to around 40.9 uh, rotations per minute. Okay, so you'll almost, right, you more than double this angular speed at which you're rotating simply by walking toward the center. Now the next question I have is what happens, what if I compare the initial and final kinetic energy of the system? How would I do that for this problem? So let's go on the next page and calculate the initial and final kinetic energies. All right, what about the kinetic energy of the system? All right, let's do the initial configuration first. 
So the kinetic energy is really only due to rotation. And that you can write as one half uh, the total moment of inertia of the system and multiplied by that initial angular frequency that we found. Now again, so you write one half. Now the total moment of inertia is the moment of inertia of the disk plus the moment of inertia of the student in the initial configuration multiplied by omega squared. So now you can substitute the values we had here. So, okay, uh, rotation, at least initially here, what we have is one half. Again, the disk is one half MR squared for a solid disk. And the student was little mass, radius squared, and omega I squared. All right, you substitute in all our values that we have here. So we can do that. So here we go, one half. This is one half, the mass is 100. Uh, this was two squared plus 60, and again, two squared. And my initial angular frequency was uh, 2.094, and don't forget to square that value. Uh, at the end, if you do this, I get 965 joules for my initial kinetic energy. All right, so let me just write it as K initial. All right, what about the final? Well, so K rotation. Again, final, it's going to look similar to that second equation I have here, except that we have to adjust for that moment of inertia has changed and the final omega frequency has changed. So I'm gonna write it like this. So the moment of inertia of the disk in its final configuration is the same. However, the man has changed again, right? So it's M R F squared and multiply by omega F squared. All right, so we go ahead now, we substitute in all their numbers. So we get one half, one half times 100, two squared plus 60, 0 0.5 squared. And all of this multiplied by that final angular frequency, which I solved for 4.285 squared. And I get a final rotational kinetic energy of the system which is equal to 1974 joules. Well, think about this for a minute. I started off with an initial value of 965 and I walked toward the center. And at the end, I have 1974 joules of rotational energy. Guess what? That means I have a change of kinetic energy. The change is always a final value minus an initial. If you take the 1974 minus 965, I get 1,009 joules of extra energy. Where did this come from, right? Who supplied this, okay? That's actually a really, really good question. Something you have to think about for a while. Whenever you change the kinetic energy of an object is because there was some work being done. And in this case, the work being done is the work being done by the student. As the student walks toward the center of that platform, he does work on the system, okay? That's where this extra energy comes from, okay? It has to come from somewhere it came from the student. All right, that's it for me, folks. Hopefully you enjoyed this video.